Hola, environmentalist, and welcome to your first lecture. Just to kind of orientate you to how this process works, you will be using your interactive lectures on environmental science book. That's a big spiral bound notebook with some beautiful pictures on the front. And you're going to be using lectures 1 through 20 in this course because you're environmental 1301 is the course that you're in right now. If you take environmental science 1302, you'll be using lectures 21 through 40. So let's talk about how that works. As I go through the content, there's some blanks that you're going to fill in. So if you don't get the blank the first time, you can just pause, go back and get it. But this notebook is your treasure because you're going to be using this notebook and it's going to be a powerful tool for you to be able to take your exams. So make sure that you get each blank filled in properly and that you watch the lectures from start to finish. Writing in your book as you're watching a lecture actually uses all three major learning styles, which is visual, audio, which is hearing, and then tactile, which deals with using your hands. So all three of these things come together and make for a great solution for you learning the content of environmental science. Each time we have a lecture, I'm going to quickly touch on what the learning objectives are. Learning objectives are set by the state, and we need to be able to demonstrate that we are meeting those learning objectives for the course. So while you may not think they're the most important part of each lecture, hopefully if you got these items down, you'll be able to test very well for that unit or for that lecture. So our learning objectives for biomes part one or lecture one is that we're going to look at some of the main biomes. We'll look at the others in the lecture number two, which is the second part of biomes. And then we're going to look at specific attributes, characteristics, and aspects of each and one of those biomes. So which biomes are we going to look at? Three of the majors in this particular lecture. And we'll look at their sub-biomes. So this is important for you to understand that biomes are large groups and the sub-biomes are categorized within those. So how do we define a biome? So interestingly, there are lots of different ways that you can define them. So let's just kind of start at the beginning. Dot, 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 the world's major communities, according to Campbell, that is, classified according to predominant vegetation characterized by adaptions of organisms to that particular environment. So you're looking at more than just a place. You're looking at characteristics of vegetation, climate, in terms of how much rainfall they, that area gets. You're looking at living organisms. You're also looking at non-living organisms. We'll get to that in a little while. So according to dictionary.com, a complex biotic, biotic referring to biology, by the way, living, a complex biotic community characterized by distinctive plant and animal species and maintained under specific climate conditions of a region, especially such as a community that had developed to a climax. More specifically, we refer to biomes as an ecosystem, and they're grouped together to make them easier to study because there's many biomes across the world, and their biomes can be found in every continent on the globe. So it's important to understand that biomes may vary slightly, but you've got these sub-biomes in which a, an island community, for example, might fit. Biomes are classified according to precipitation, temperature, soils, flora and fauna. So let me define those terms. Flora or plants, fauna or living organisms like animals. And geographic location, latitude. And latitude is like if you have the equator, it's lines of the equator that go up to the poles north and south. So as you move up in latitude, you will see a distinctive change in climate conditions, precipitation, wind patterns. So all of these things fit together to help us define a biome. 
So a biome subparts share similar climates, planets, and animals. And as we go through each of the majors and sub uh, biomes, I think you'll see how that fits together. Biomes are determined by a combination of both biotic and abiotic factors. I define biotic as living, abiotic are non-living factors. So let's talk about those. I think biotic's the easiest to get your brain around because these are things that are living. They're plants, they're vegetation, they're animals, they're living organisms. But just as important to the biotic are the abiotic. Now, I'm a geologist by trade, but not just because of that do I think abiotic's important. I think it's so important because it dictates what living things can be there. So the non-living things, quote unquote, is what abiotic refers to. So that could be the latitude. Are you at 30 degrees or are you at 60 degrees north or south latitude? That's going to be important to what is living there. Also, soils. Soils are direct issue in correlation to what can live there. Some plants require very acidic soils. Some require very uh, nutrient-rich soils. So it matters as to what type of soils you have. And soils are different in each biome. Altitude is looking at how high an elevation that a sub-biome or a biome might exist. Climate is a huge term dealing with long-term weather patterns in a region. We'll be getting to climate towards the end of the semester. So what are the criteria of a biome? I like to look at this as the standard biome pyramid and over here is the warmest and the wettest, over here is the warmest and the driest or the hottest and the driest. As you go up in latitude, so this would say zero degrees, 10 to 15 degrees, and you start getting into uh, 30 to 40, maybe even 50 degrees north and south latitude. Then you start getting into 50 to 60-ish degrees north and south latitude. Then you get up to 90 up here. So you're looking at the polar regions up here. So as you go up from the base of each side of the pyramid, it's getting cooler. And if you go away from this side, which is the hot in the wet side, you're progressively getting drier. So if you correlate that to going up in latitude, like from the 30 to the 40 to the 50 to the 70 to the 90, you're going to see that as you increase in latitude, you decrease in temperature. And you're like, well, that's a dumb moment, Elaine. It is, but if you start to look at the vegetation that's associated with each of these biomes, you can see that there's vegetation, but it, that it dramatically changes as we go from very warm and lots of rain to very dry, little bitty rain, and then each time that we go up into a different set of biomes and subbiomes, you can see there's a gradual change with precipitation. Biomes are defined by climatic zones. So that means they're impacted by the climates that I just described on the climate pyramid over here, or bi biome pyramid. These zones include the temperature, precipitation, latitude, elevation, soil types, and abiotic factors. So each of these things contribute to why we classify a biome in a specific region and the specific characteristics that make each one unique. So when we continue to define a biome, each biome contains various sub-biomes. So it gets a bit uh, confusing, <laughs> and so you have to kind of get a sheet of paper out and classify them and write them down so you can kind of see that they follow a trend. These various subbiomes can be divided into even more specific regional and even uh, site-specific subbiomes. We're going to focus on six major biomes this semester and their uh, accompanying subbiomes and talk to you about the majors. So when we look at biomes, this is a pictorial overview of biomes, and as you look at them, notice the precipitation, here's zero uh, centimeters up to over 400, and then you see the average temperature in Celsius, not Fahrenheit, and you start to see a trend. 
So over here in the tundra, we have very little precipitation up to 100 centimeters. Most of that would be in snow, obviously. And you have a very cold temperature. So it's going to be much drier than if you're looking at something like the tropical rainforest. And then notice the temperature is also the warmest on the chart or next to the warmest to subtropical deserts, savannas, and uh, other types of deserts. So when we look at each of these biomes, I'm wanting you to think about where does it fit on this particular scheme here, this chart, and also, going back one, the pyramid as well. So what are the six main biomes? In lecture one, we're going to overview the forest, the freshwater, and the moraine. When we get to lecture two, we'll cover the rest, which is tundra, grasslands, and deserts. So when you think of biomes, we're going to introduce a number of new terms that may be uh, things you've heard before or maybe not. And so hopefully you'll come away with some new information. So we're going to start on one of the biggest biomes called forests. This is going to be classified as biome one in your notes. Where did forests come from? So scrolling back the time, geologically speaking, Forest had to come after the first plants migrated or actually appeared on land. So ancient plants began to show up during the Silurian period. So we're going to roll that back to about 420 million years ago. But it really wouldn't become a big deal in terms of making forests till the late Devonian and early Mississippian period where we started to get major forests around the globe. So plants started out needing to be near water, and then they were able to germinate and outside the presence of water. So there was an evolutionary process to how forests began to evolve. So when we look at this, the Silurian period, if you didn't have a geologic time scale it, for uh, the Phanerozoic Eon, it goes Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Mississippian, Pennsylvanian, and then Permian for the Paleozoic era. So ancient forests were dominated by giant cattails. We have these today. They look like they have a, a hot dog wiener at the top. And uh, they have in that hot dog uh, areas where all the seeds are for the cattails. So when they break open, millions of little seeds get released. We have cycads today. They did back then too. Mosses and fern leaves. And these things measured over 40 feet in height. Gymnosperms, which are conifers and cycads, evolved during the late Paleozoic era. Getting the Paleozoic right is kind of important because a sequence of events led to plants getting on onto land. And we know definitively by the Silurian plants had taken root on land. During the late Paleozoic, we noticed that Forests were everywhere, so they had learned how to germinate outside the presence of water, and the expansion meant that they could go to places like mountains and anywhere that water did not exist. So there are still uh, certain types of forests that rely on water, and others do not in terms of having like a water body, a lake, or a, a marsh. Now, during the Triassic and Jurassic periods, we had massive forests. This is during the dinosaur time frame, by the way. And that would have been important food resources for dinosaurs. Traditionally, most gymnosperms lived in a tropical rain uh, climate several hundred million years ago and evolved to be able to survive in harsher climates during the following eras as they can today. So plants have gone through a lot of evolution. And by the way, we didn't get flowering plants till the beginning of the Cretaceous period, and they're called angiosperms. The Cretaceous period is when Tyrannosaurus rex lived, to kind of give you a reference point. The origins of forest, speaking of angiosperms, <laughs> that is kind of a really important marker in geologic time and is very important to this course because angiosperms, quote unquote, flowering plants, initially appeared during the early Cretaceous period, somewhere around 146 million years ago to probably about 100 million years ago. So the Cretaceous lasted from 146 million to 66 million years ago. 
The very first angiosperm found and documented in the rock record as a fossil is a magnolia. So important for scientists, like my house is filled with magnolias because of the importance and not just the beauty of the flower, but scientifically it represents all flowering plants. Angiosperms are a higher evolved plant because their flowers are are much more uh, complex and they have dense cell structures in which the other types of plants do not. Angiosperm plants produce fruits. Gymnosperms do not. They produce cones. That's one good way to determine which type of plant you're talking about. Forest contains 70% of the known carbon present in living things, not dead things like, for example, permafrost, where you have dead plants that release things like carbon and methane when they melt. So when you look at the different types of trees, let's kind of put them on each side of the coin. Uh, gymnosperms are on the right. Those are going to be your cone-bearing plants. And then your angiosperms are, see if you can get it, what type of plants are they? flowering plants. So a gymnosperm is going to produce a, a cone, angiosperm flowers. Get back to gymnosperms, again they produce cones <laughs> and angiosperms produce fruit. Then gymnosperms are the softwoods, the hardwoods are the angiosperms, important if you're remodeling your house or building a house and you're trying to figure out what type of wood you need to use, go with hardwood. Uh, gymnosperms grow quickly, angiosperms take a long time to grow. Gymnosperms are evergreen, angiosperms are deciduous, meaning they lose their leaves each year. Gymnosperms produce needles, angiosperms produce leaves. Gymnosperms are older, geologically speaking, angiosperms are younger but more evolved. Gymnosperms prefer low nutrient soil, so often they prefer acidic soils, and then angiosperms produce or prefer high nutrient enriched soils. We'll talk more about that when we get to deciduous forest. Gymnosperms have a passion for cold weather and they love it, and angiosperms are a little bit more uh, temperamental. They can enjoy seasonal weather, but they do need some warm weather in there somewhere. So let's talk about forest and its subbiomes. The boreal. Sometimes we refer this to the softwood or the taiga. I'm intrigued by the taiga because of the mammals that live there, and one in particular is the moose. Uh, bull mooses, which are males, actually lose their antlers every year, and as they age, their antlers get bigger each year until they reach a certain threshold. It has to do with the amount of testosterone they have. Side note to that is it doesn't hurt when they actually knock their horns off and they only use their horns for mating season and then when it's cold, they knock them off. So just a sidebar, something cool about mooses. And uh, so you can know that. That might be an interesting thing to have in your side notes. So this is the largest terrestrial subbiome that covers 11% of the Earth's land, of which that's going to be in the Northern Hemisphere. So it makes up 29% of all the world's forest and it's located between 50 to 60 degrees north latitude. Notice it didn't say south latitude, north latitude. Taiga means forest in Russian <clears throat> and Boreas was the Greek god of the North Wind. Flora tends to prefer cooler temperatures and climate and it can handle up to negative 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Yuck, that's cold, but it can also handle occasional heat. So in this particular area, we're going to have a lot of softwoods. So think about softwoods. Those are going to be your gymnosperms. So the boreal has numerous ponds and lakes. Matter of fact, Alaska is known as the state of a million lakes, if you didn't know that. Snow amounts are much deeper than in the tundra, and winters are less severe than in the tundra. We'll be getting to tundra later. Up to 50% of annual precipitation is received in the boreal, though some areas experience over 200 centimeters, which equates to about 80 inches of precipitation a year in the form of snow. Some plants can also absorb fogs and mist for water, and that's going to help them with the transpiration portion of the water cycle. So when we look at Boreal, this is what we're referring to. This is its location, and remember, it's only in the northern hemisphere. In the Boreal, the soil is thin, 
acidic and nutrient poor because it's full of thousands of years of detrital or detritus material that break down in from old needles. So when you're looking at this, remember we are talking about softwoods, so they're over in the gymnosperm category. If you have a forest rich in angiosperms, you're going to lose their leaves every year, so you're going to have a very nutrient-rich soil. In the boreal, the limited understory, meaning of the actual forest itself, where the trees are, they have a cold-tolerant and shallow root trees. They can exist in uh, patchy permafrost, and permafrost refers to soils that are frozen year-round or most of the year. What lives in the boreal? Largely birds and mammals with very few reptiles, and I think the reptiles is kind of obvious why they're not there, because it's just too cold. Boreal only exists in the northern hemisphere unless caused by alpine shifts, which causes it to move a little bit up and down in terms of latitude. There are two types of boreal uh, forest, and one is called the closed canopy and the high forest like Canada with spread out trees and lichens. By the way, this is lichen material right here, and this is the kind of stuff that the needles uh, and the soil will look like over thousands of years once they've had a chance to decay. And the boreal, what are your major plants? You get conifers, that's spruce, fir, larch, and then deciduous. My favorite tree is an aspen tree. I just love aspens. I think they're beautiful. And birch. But you're like, well, how can you have both in the same place? I'm not saying you can't have hardwoods and softwoods in the same place, but you have a dominance of one. So conifers are going to win in this category. So why do we have so many conifers? It's because of the acidic soils that exist there. All right, the major animals. I told you I love moose, so that's why it has a smiley face by it. Caribou, wolves, bears, rodents, rabbits, lynx, minks, migratory birds. Very rare to see an amphibian and even more rare to see a reptile. And certainly the higher you go in elevation or latitude, the more true that's going to be because of the temperature change. So when we look at that pictorial overview, taiga's right here. So we're looking at colder temperatures up to this amount of centimeters of rainfall. So we're on the cooler side of the temperature, somewhere in the moderate range of precipitation, with most of that being in the form of snow. The temperate deciduous, what a beautiful place to visit. The temperate deciduous forest is all about losing its leaves every year. Now let's focus on temperate. Temperate has to do with the latitude. So the deciduous forest decides how it will look based on its season. Deciduous trees shed their leaves before the cold or dry seasons appear. So like after the first uh, frost, hard freeze, you'll see deciduous trees start to change colors. So they go from their green color to red, then they start to get into the yellows and the browns, and then they fall off, which is hence the reason that fall leaves are so uh, beautiful and the, the colors that we use for fall and Thanksgiving celebrations here in America. During this time, the leaves often turn the colors I just described, and the new leaves reappear in the spring. But you have to think about where the old ones went. They fell to the ground. So now they're a source of nutrients as they decay. We often refer to the temperate deciduous as deciduous or hardwood. Commonly, they are found in eastern North America, northeastern Asia, western and central Europe. And these primarily consist of angiosperms and broad-leaved plants, such as oak trees. Enjoy well-defined seasons and cold winters and hot summers. But it's because they exist in the latitudes where we would expect to find a dominance of temperate uh, deciduous forest. Six to eight months that they grow and they have frost-free growing seasons, allowing them to get bigger and allowing them over time to be larger than our gymnosperms. They get much older. Temperatures can range from minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit all the way to 100 degrees. So they have a wide spectrum of temperature. And the temperate deciduous forests Forests can sometimes be several hundred feet tall, like the Sequoia National Forest. If you've not been there in California, it is totally worth a visit. Some of the trees they actually have one you can drive through, and it's uh, that's how wide the trunk is. 
all deciduous forests are going to enjoy fertile soils because of the deciduous leaves that fall off every year and decay and make a very, very rich topsoil in organic material known as O matter. And that produces a deep clay layer underneath, and clay doesn't let much water through, so it holds that water for the roots of that particular tree. So again, the clay helps retain nutrients and minerals that are not absorbed by the plants. And then temperate deciduous possesses seven to eight tree species per square mile. What kind of mammals will you find there? You'll find mostly mammals and birds uh, that enjoy the forest environment. You'll see some reptiles further south, because remember we're in a lower latitude, and insects depending upon the particular forest location. You'll see very dense canopies with deep root systems. So when you look at the seasons here, you're like, okay, this is the same place when you look at it. You're like, all right, this is probably spring or summer. Well, this is probably fall right over here because we don't have any leaves, or at least it's winter, right, after all the leaves have fallen off. So this is the difference in uh, deciduous, just the, the green during growing season and the barren during the non-growing season. When you look at the boreal season here, this could be year round because you're gonna see this all year. And then I see some growth here. So remember the deciduous trees are gonna lose their leaves, but this is a conifer right here. So it should have them all year round. So you gotta know your trees and understand that there's a variety of things that are there. During the temperate deciduous forest change of leaves, this is what you should see. If you wanna to go to one of the most beautiful places during the fall season to see fall trees change colors, take the scenic byway, Blue Ridge Parkway that goes through the Appalachian Mountain Range or the Smoky Mountains, and you will just go bonkers over what you can see there. It's really beautiful. What kind of the plants and major animals should you expect? All right, on the plant side, we'll see oaks, hickories, magnolias, and underlying shrub layers and saplings. But in mammals, you'd expect to see what you'd find in any forest. Mountain lions slash cougars, wolves, bison, deer, bears, small mammals, lots of birds, declining amphibian populations, but betcha you, you can definitely see the reptiles. I've been hiking a lot in the temperate deciduous and run into some that are not the kind you want to see. So where is the temperate deciduous forest? The areas that you see in green are the dominant areas around the world. And you can see that the United States has, and North America, has a very strong section of that, kind of east of I-35. And then when you look in Europe, they're covered with it. Some parts of the Far East are, even a little bitty section of Australia has a, a lot of temperate deciduous forest. All right, when we think about the temperate rainforest, oh, wow, the rainforest. Everybody sees rainforest and they think of the equator, but the temperate rainforest is located uh, much higher in latitude. So it's a good place to think about that is the inner passage of Alaska. And also the picture that you see here, I took an Olympic National Park in Washington State. That's a great place to see a temperate rainforest. Similar to temperate deciduous forest, but it's different in a couple of important ways. The amount of rainfall is the most important. Between 200 and 380 centimeters of annual rainfall. So it rains every day almost in the temperate rainforest, just like it does in the tropical rainforest. The annual temperature is above freezing with the highest averages being around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Soil is very high in organics. That should make sense because there's lots of angiosperms or deciduous plants there. And low in specific low, uh, soil nutrients where you have conifers. They're usually located near a coast, which is certainly the case in the inner passage of Alaska and Washington State's famous Olympic National Park. So uh, these are very common areas to see a temperate rainforest. This is a small biome as compared to the others. Uh, when you look at the broad spectrum of the boreal forest, the biggest portions in the Pacific Northwest coast, which is what I described for Washington State and of course all the Alaska inner passage, you can find it in New Zealand. When I visited New Zealand, this temperate rainforest was packed, especially on the northern island. So good place to go see that. 
mainly full of conifers, mosses, ferns, lichens, and a wide assortment of wild flowers. It's a beautiful place to visit. The temperate rainforest is also known for a rapid nutrient recycling, and it has most of its nutrients are living things and not the soil itself. So you've got a lot of bugs doing jobs, breaking down soils. It's often and sometimes, but I'm going to say often, referred to as the old growth forest. I can guarantee you that's a test question because it's your densest, oldest trees. And so it has a very rich canopy. When you look at the temperate rainforest, it's very beautiful. On the left, this is actually from New Zealand. And uh, this is what it looks like in New Zealand as you walk around on the Northern Island, very dense uh, forest. And on the right over here is Olympic National Park in Washington State. In the temperate rainforest, what are the major plants? Hemlocks, Douglas fir, red cedar, spruce, mosses, ferns, lots of shrubs, animals, whale, squirrels, rodents, mule deer, birds, amphibians, and even reptiles. What you're missing there are some of the bigger mammals, not saying they won't be there, but these are the major animals that stay put in the area. Well, we can't talk about one rainforest without addressing the more famous of the two, and that's the tropical rainforest. Technically, these are deciduous trees, but they are grouped in a different category because they never lose their leaves. So pause for a second, think about this. With deciduous trees that actually lose their leaves, we know that they produce organically rich soils. You're not going to see the same thing in the tropical rainforest. They have shallow root systems and they do not have good soils, organically rich soils. Most of the water that's in the region is recycled through transpiration. And that's where the leaves actually ooze out what water the plant doesn't need. So when you slash and burn or cut down large sections of tropical rainforest, you're actually going to shift the climate from being very high in water in the atmosphere to being very dry. We find these areas near equators and they have two basic seasons with very little variation and the amount of day to night hours. So you get about 12 day hours of daylight, 12 hours of nighttime. And the two basic seasons are rainy and dry. So it's pretty straightforward. Over 200 centimeters of annual rainfall occur each year in tropical rainforest and oftentimes more than that. And again, they have poor soils, and it goes back to even though they got deciduous plants, they're not losing their leaves because it never gets cold enough for the snap, the frost to start the let's fall off uh, sequence of events and color change. There are a hundred different tree species in a square mile, so it is like the most diverse of all of the ecosystems that we'll talk about. Hence, it's the most productive biome and the greatest terrestrial diversity of species. Let me define terrestrial, meaning on land. Temperatures usually uh, exceed around 70 degrees Fahrenheit, but inside the forest itself, if the canopy is really dense, then it's gonna, it could be cooler. There's such a high diversity of species, and where those species live are, is very important. There are four distinct layers of the tropical rainforest. The floor, which is the base, and then the understory, which is right above that, right above the floor, all the way up to 60 feet. So you can get primarily plant life and some uh, mammalian life there. But the upper canopy is where you're going to see the action. So as you're walking around in the rainforest, better be looking and having eyes on the top of your head that can see what's above you because not only are things that swing and hang and perch, there are also predators in the trees. So that 60 to 100 feet marker, those are important areas for life forms. Emergent trees are those like the ones in the picture on your screen. They are the ones that are way up in the sky above the canopy. So I got to do a bird count once and they dropped us into the trees uh, from a helicopter and then we had to count birds. And what I was really struck by was it wasn't the emergent trees, it was the upper canopy where most of the life was. Only 3% of light actually reaches the forest floor in the tropical rainforest. And then you can see lots of air plants. It's super important. So these means these plants uh, thrive just in the open air. They do really well with that. Something bad's been going on with the tropical rainforest in terms of environmental concerns, and that's that they have declined in numbers substantially. 
200 years ago, rainforests covered 20% of the Earth's land surface. In 2008, they covered only 6%. So that number is declining annually as slash and burn and clear cutting processes occur. Half of the plants and animals living today depend on a tropical rainforest for habitat and survival. So why is the rainforest being destroyed? The economic value per acre is not as high, so it can, if we could convert it into some type of agricultural use, that seems like a good investment to many people. So logging industries, also medical research, don't rule out that lots of cancer studies and research has happened because of unique and rare species found in the tropical rainforest. Clearing out the land to encourage local economic growth. So the, the people who own these lands are typically uh, in third world countries, not always, and most of them give up their land uh, and are paid to convert it into agricultural land. So the slash and burn, that's what this looks like right here, that causes so many issues because now you're losing that source of water through transpiration and the tropical rainforest, and that's going to shift the climate long term. 90% test question for sure of creatures live in the upper canopy. And I've been in the upper canopy and can attest to this. It's true. You'll see everything. So insects, reptiles, amphibians, birds, sloths. Love sloths. They're just so cool, right? Here's one right over here. Uh, primates, rodents, and don't forget predators even hang out in trees too, so be careful. When you look at the tropical rainforest on our diagram again, you can see it's on the warmest side and the wettest side. So warm and wet equate to high diversity. So freshwater is biome number two, and as we get into freshwater, let's talk about the origins of freshwater. Freshwater in nature originates from precipitation. Uh, this is caused by and referred to as the hydrological biogeochemical cycle. Wow, what a mouthful, right? So let's break that down. Hydro means water, bio, biology or living, geo is rock, and chemical is the reactions of those things. So we're looking at water, living, rocks, interactive cycle. That's what's happening here. So in this course, fresh water is generally defined as water having a salt concentration of less than 500 parts per million ppm. Reality is when I worked for the Brazos River Authority and was doing water quality monitoring, fresh water was less than two parts per million. So um, there is an actual threshold in which you can get to salt water, and we'll talk about that later. So when you see science servings, that's always cool because there's the extra good to know thing to be able to discuss with people and have an intellectual conversation. And in many cases, it also ends the lecture. In this case, it doesn't, but we're going to keep going. But when you see science servings towards the end of a lecture, you know that you're getting to that point where you can take a break. In the world, only 2.5% of all the world's water is fresh. That's not very much fresh water. Of that percentage, 1.97 is frozen in glaciers and in the ice caps. All life that needs fresh water lives on or about 0.53%, so about half of that 1%, which is what's available at the surface of the earth. 0.5% of fresh water is groundwater, and that's water that exists under the ground. The largest freshwater lake in the world is located in Siberia, and it's not the Caspian Sea. <laughs> this place is really unique, and we're going to learn more about it uh, in the future. So the message here is that fresh water at the surface is scarce. And by the way, in the United States, it's already claimed by the government, and the government sells the water as water rights. Groundwater is a different ball game, at least in Texas. And other states... It really belongs to the government, but you still have the right to pull it up and use it for economic use. So when you look at all the biomes, where's the water? Well, you're looking at, okay, I know it's where the most rainfall is. Well, yes, obviously if you have rain, you're going to have more water, but you even have water all the way over here in tundra. So let's keep going and look at fresh water. Ponds, lake, and lacustrine environments. You're like, hmm, what is that word, lacustrine? It means lake, by the way. So we're going to define a lake or pond 
as an inland body of standing water, typically fresh but can also be saline or salty. They vary dramatically in size from little ponds that can be called playa lakes all the way into something like the Great Lakes. Most lakes and ponds are created one of three ways. By glaciers, which the Great Lakes were created by glaciers. Humans make lakes, so there's only one non-man-made lake in Texas. It's Caddo Lake. And the rest of them were dug by people to hold water and deal with blood retention of water. And then the third way is by beavers. So you gotta love the beavers. Lacustrine is the term that's applied to lakes. It's an actual geologic term. So you need to know that for test questions because environmentally we refer to lakes as lacustrine. Some lakes and ponds consist of different zones called the littoral, the limnetic, the profundal, the benthic, and abyssal. So uh, the littoral is the shoreline. That's gonna be the area right around here. And the limnetic is going to be the stuff way out here. The profundal is the stuff way at the bottom. We're probably not going to have in most of our lakes the uh, benthic or abyssal because they're just not deep enough. Where that might not be true is in some lakes that were created by glaciers. Rivers and streams are referred to as fluvial. That's with an F, not a P. There is a reason why that's important. Pluvial is actually a glacial lake, just so you know. Fluvial with an F refers to river environments. These are large natural streams of water that flow into a channel to the sea, lake, or other stream. They typically move in one direction, from high elevation to low elevation. They're more common globally than lacustrine lake environments. As snowmelt occurs in North America and the temperature is generally cooler at the headwaters than it is at the melt. The headwaters is where the, the stream or river fluvial system originates at the highest elevation point of the river and the mouth is the lowest point of the river. Biodiversity increases as water approaches lower altitudes and warmer areas towards the mouth of the river. The mouth's where it feeds into another water body. They often suffer from higher levels of turbidity, which is dirt, and I would also include nutrients in that, especially if you have sources of human or mammalian or waste that are able to wash off when it rains. Wetlands, swamps, bogs, and marshes. They're generally hot and humid, though they experience two main seasons, wet and dry. And also, the hydrophytes are the primary plants that thrive in this environment because there's extremely rich nutrient soil. So this area right here is part of Caddo Lake in Texas. And notice that's actually water where the grain is. And so you can see that it's uh, overrun with nutrients. It's very, very calm water. So it's very still. And uh, these areas can be fresh, salty, or brackish waters that sometimes combine massive river deltas together and also can be what's in between the shoreline where the ocean connects to the continent and water and high tide flow inland. So that's why it can be brackish, meaning partly salty. There's a high diversity of species within this areas of numerous reptiles and mammals. And today they're traditionally seen as useless real estate because humans could not cultivate there. However, they do produce coal over millions of years. So um, as a geologist, we look for areas in rock record that have lots of tree decay deposits and it makes coal layers. Today they're used as a means of natural filtration, refuge and flood control. So they are protected in most areas of the United States and a great place that you might be familiar with would be the Everglades National Park. And that is an example of a swamp. Swamps, wetlands, bogs and marshes come in all different types and each one has a unique uh, characteristic. That's a whole nother course in itself in freshwater. But this is actually the area of the Waco wetlands. You can see, as you look at that, that is a marsh, a freshwater marsh, by the way. Let's talk about groundwater. The most common type of easily accessible freshwater is groundwater. All we have to do is drill down and get it. Sometimes it comes to the surface on its own because of a discharge location like a spring or artesian well. But a body of permeable rock contains or transmits water, meaning it allows water to move. So the couple of terms that are important for groundwater, aquifers. These are rock layers that transmit 
wa groundwater. And so an aquifer is a rock layer that actually moves water through it. Aquitard, one of my favorite terms, uh, does not allow water to pass through. It is a rock layer that's impermeable like clay. It's a beneficial layer for holding water in something. So that's why landfills, for example, that you'll learn about a little bit later in the semester and certainly environmental science too, has actually man-made versions of aquitards. They have clay layers and even a very high dollar layer they put in there to prevent any kind of leachate, which is commonly referred to as trash juice from leaching out into groundwater systems. Springs is another important term for groundwater. These are groundwaters that bubble up to the surface and a special type of system in groundwater is called an artesian well and that's where it bubbles up under its own uh, strength because it's in two aquitards. So you get two layers that are aquitards and the water's in between them. So when a hole's dr uh, drilled down into it, it just literally sprays up like an oil rig. So where are groundwater systems. So remember we learned the word aquitard, an aquaclude is another term for an aquitard. So in this case we'd have a confined aquifer that'd be like an artesian well and an unconfined aquifer. The dotted line here represents the level that should normally be there. It would rise and fall with uh, the wetness of it. So you can see if we get an area where the aquifer intersects the surface it's gonna, the water table will actually spill into something like a river. So rivers actually are impacted by groundwater. Groundwater becomes a very important element when we consider that 57% of Texans utilize it for drinking water. <laughs> and that number can even be higher in some states, lower in others. Important resource because it's underground. Unfortunately, that does not mean it's safe to drink or clean. Different story. Let's get into the third biome of this lecture, biome three. Marine environment is by far the largest biome in the world covering three-fourths of the Earth's surface. Marine areas contain salt water. So what does that mean? Most ocean water has salt concentration between 3.1% and 3.8%. So when you're looking at it, they usually have thousand parts per million or more. I mean, they have a lot of salt in them. The kelp and phytoplankton, kelp is a type of algae, by the way, that are located in oceans provide about 50% of our oxygen. There are 366 million trillion gallons of water on Earth, both fresh and salt combined. So if you didn't know this, oceans started to develop back in the Precambrian eon, literally right around 2.0 billion year to about 1.7 billion years ago when a real cool thing called stromatolites began to evolve. And they produced oxygen that filled up the water and caused the iron to drop out. And then when the water was saturated with oxygen, it sent it up into the atmosphere and created an oxygenated atmosphere. There's relatively little known about the ocean. Even though we've been to the moon, we've had limited exploration in the oceans as compared to other biomes on the surface. So terrestrial, meaning on land, we really have had a hard time getting to the bottom of the ocean evaporates and provides for freshwater precip uh, precipitation, which is an important element of the ocean. So people say, well, the solution to our drinking water problems as freshwater diminishes is, well, let's just take the ocean water. There's some issues with that because there's a fine balance between how much salt needs to be in the ocean to keep currents running properly and also uh, for animals to be able to develop their shells and corals to do their thing. It's an idea, and we can do it to a limited uh, amount of success, but it's not the answer to our long-term problems. The oceans originated from a combination of comets and volcanic outgassing, and don't forget about stromatolites, and they remain because of the Earth's early atmospheric stability during deep time, which is the Precambrian Eon. The water on other planets and moon has a much higher salt concentration than here on Earth, and today scientists estimate that at least 230,000 different life species actually are present and live in salt water, but likely much higher because we haven't been able to study the abyss and even deep sea trenches the way we would have liked. So it's very expensive. So what are the marine subbiomes? When we look at 
a pictorial overview of biomes. Still no water. What's up with this? You're like, hmm, not finding marine on here. Well, these are terrestrial environments. Let's talk about the ocean's different sub-biomes. Intertidal. These are the beaches and continental shelf that's typically susceptible to tidal forces. So that's going to be your beach lines and near shore environments. The pelagic and limnetic. These are considered to be the open ocean areas, which tend to have limited life forms. The top layer that interacts with the ocean currents, which impact weather systems. So this part of the limnetic system is very important. Benthic, the way I always remember benthic, B for bottom. The ocean bottom, which consists of sand and silt and decaying organisms, contains many bottom-dwelling species that utilize that as a food resource. The abyssal, like it's often referred to as the abyssal plain, relatively flat, deep, extremely cold, and high-pressurized section of the ocean floor. Not the entire ocean is flat at the very bottom. It's quite the contrary. The Hadal Zone includes the deep sea trenches, which it contain the highest pressure sites in the ocean. So this is the areas where we have two plates that are sub, uh, one subducting underneath another, and we get a deep sea trench like the Marianas Trench. Coral reefs, these are the marine superstars. You gotta love them. But they've got issues, friends. I mean, they seriously have some issues, like in the Caribbean. These places are referred to as the rainforest of the seas. They really are. They're contain rich nutrients uh, as coral extracts, various nutrients from algae and plankton. It's a very delicate balance of these three elements. So there are four types, atoll or atoll, depending on who you speak to. These are very unique types of coral reefs that have grown on tops of the cones of submerged volcanic islands. Midway, if you do a Google search on that, that's a place where we have a military installation, important for World War II especially. That would be a great pictorial view if you want to look up what one of those is. A barrier reef parallels the shore, open uh, in between with the sand barge uh, that goes between them. But not all barrier reefs are like the Great Barrier Reef, because I've been and I've actually been underwater in the Great Barrier Reef, I've been above it in a plane, I can tell you that the Barrier Reef in Australia has every kind of reef known to man. Fringing reefs are by far the most common. They grow close to or adjacent to shore. They have shallow lagoons. They also have sand uh, barges between each major section of fringe, so they're very popular for diving. Patch reefs look more like little cities of corals. They're small isolated reefs that defy each of the above categories. They're all different shapes, but they're just like a patch you'd put on a shirt. I mean, they're just little patchy areas that have coral reefs and the marine life that goes with it. So by far, the most common is fringing. Coral reefs are found in warm, shallow waters between 68 degrees to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So where you see the red dots are where corals exist around the world. You can see that there is a direct correlation to latitude. Most of them are Holocene in age. That means they're less than 10,000 years old. Holocene is the epoch in which we are currently living. Coral is a dominant organism, though they represent the greatest site for biodiversity in our planet, even beyond the tropical rainforest. They're formed from calcium carbonate, known as CaCO3, and the skeleton of organisms like corals actually will remain on Earth underwater or wash up on to shorelines, let's say after a hurricane, and the animals are gone. Their habitat for economically important species and about 30 to 50 percent of them are actually endangered across the globe. They protect our coastlines from erosion, important during a hurricane as storm surge comes on to land, also during tsunami events. So as we kind of look at some of those features throughout the semester, we'll kind of revisit the importance of coral reefs. So I want you to look at the coral reef on the left. This is one in Jamaica. And by the way, most corals in the Caribbean aren't nearly as colorful because as some like you would find in the Middle East that have more salt concentrations in the water. So the one on the left is very healthy. Look at the amount of fish population. You see, I see corals, I see sponges, I see a very healthy ecosystem. The one on the right is the same basic area 
about 10 years later. And this is a whole system, so this still has some of the algae in it, this does not. So this is totally bleached out. So that's an unhealthy reef system, it's dead. So that's why you don't see very many animals there. And also notice the water clarity here, the turbidity is very high. Corals don't like high turbidity. They need to have clear moving water in order to extract out the nutrients from the water that they need to survive. The brain coral on the left is very, very healthy. The brain coral on the right has black banding disease, which is something that will actually kill the entire structure fairly quickly in modern time. So this is something that's very common in the Caribbean if you go diving in that area. Let's look at estuaries, brackish zones. These were created when fresh water and salt water merged together. The water and salinity levels vary with the rise and fall of the tides and precipitation. They create micro ecosystems where unique species prefer specific salt concentrations. Sometimes they're referred to as the salt pans and also can be classified as intertidal zones that we learned about earlier. They're the best sites for desalinization treatment plants during droughts. But I'm telling you, looking at reverse osmosis for desalinization, it's not effective for large populations in terms of cost. So it's not the answer for our long-term drinking water problems. When we look at estuaries and brackish zones, they're highly productive systems. They utilize nutrients from the land, so they actually act as a cleaner. They allow for nutrient, cir uh, nutrient circulation and high levels of biodiversity. Mangroves, which is this stuff right over here, if you see these funny looking root systems, they become an estuary for birthing and even some larger uh, marine mammals will come in and actually give birth here like manatees. So these only exist in tropical areas. If you have non-tropical areas, you would see marshes and things of that nature. Estuary and brackish areas have been decimated for people to build uh, typically uh, cities and commercial centers such as resorts. And they build the resorts because of all the cool uh, wildlife and mammals and marines and coral reefs that exist there. This thing right here is why that stuff can exist. So if you take that out of the equation, give it enough time, and you're going to have a dead zone. So if you're ever in that decision-making power realm, consider not decimating the mangroves. Recent global headlines underscore the important role that mangroves play in our daily lives. Research and studies have placed mangroves among the most important ecosystems on our planet. They make up a transitional zone between land and sea, anchoring shorelines while buffering coastal ecosystems against hurricanes and tsunamis. Mangroves protect coral reefs from sedimentation, sequester massive amounts of carbon to combat climate change, adapt to rising sea levels, serve as nurseries and a vital food source for marine life while providing critical habitat for endangered species. Mangroves also provide invaluable green economy services for humans. The future of mangroves very much depends on us. And in fact, our future is codependent on the survival of these critical habitats. I couldn't have said it better. Protect the mangroves. So when we look at the Great Barrier Reef, that's over 1,400 miles long and houses 70 different biological zones and reef systems. In the Middle East, Asia Minor, groundwater is often salty, but less salty than the ocean. By the way, did you notice we're in science servings at the end of the lecture? Yes, the end is coming. So we use these areas to try to, that we just talked about in Asia Minor, they are used as a potential water supply, but they have to have some kind of reverse osmosis to remove the, the salt to be drinkable. Some lakes are just naturally salty, and that's because of the geology or the lack of precipitation that comes into it. And that's, for example, the Great Salt Lake in Utah. The Aral Sea went from being a useful freshwater system uh, sea to a desert in a matter of decades because of mismanagement of water. So in 1989, you look over here, you see the sea. And then here it is in 2008. Pressure increases 14.7 pounds per square inch PSI per 33 feet that you descend in deep sea 
trenches and it isn't just into deep sea trenches it's actually at the top as well so as a scuba diver every 33 feet is considered an atmosphere of water so you have to once you get beyond the first 33 feet you have to decompress as you're coming back up so you don't get the bends and so just kind of cool stuff to know if you scuba dive you know what I'm talking about when you think about this I want you to watch this video to understand the importance of how climate impacts biomes and when we're looking at water biomes. So the white that you see, that is actually salt deposits. And that leaves very, very little fresh water available for these people to use. So as we mismanage water across the globe, this is the same fate that people will face, especially as climate change impacts how and where fresh water can be utilized. And with population growth, that demands more need for fresh water consumption. So I'll see you at the next lecture. Bye.